So twin to twin transfusion occurs in identical twins or what we call monochorionic twins where two twins share a placenta. And in that placenta, there are blood vessels that are shared. So each twin has its own cord that attaches to the placenta. And between the two cords, there are blood vessels that fan out. And some of those blood vessels hook up with blood vessels from the other baby. And through these blood vessels, there can be a blood flow which can become unbalanced. And that occurs in about 10 to 15% of identical twins. It does not occur in fraternal or non-identical twins at all. And virtually all identical twins have these blood vessels. So what happens is that one baby gets too much blood and what that baby does is it, it basically pees off the extra fluid, the extra load. And as it's peeing a lot, it fills up its sac, it builds up the fluid, which we call polyhydramnios, just extra fluid. And eventually, uh, after it, it can no longer get rid of the extra fluid, by that means it goes into heart failure. So that baby can die for a combination of reasons, either because there's too much fluid and the uterus is too big, and therefore the mum goes into premature labor, or because the baby develops heart failure and may die for that reason. And sometimes the babies can become hydropic, which means they retain fluid in, in many of the body tissues. The other baby who, and, and that baby is the recipient, the recipient twin. The other baby is the donor. That's the one that's sending the blood over to its, its co-twin. And the donor, because it's, it's working so hard sending blood to its co-twin, it doesn't send blood to its kidneys anymore. So it doesn't perfuse the kidneys. And if it doesn't perfuse the kidneys, it doesn't make urine. And if the baby doesn't make urine, it doesn't pee because amniotic fluid is essentially urine. So what happens is we get one baby with very little or no amniotic fluid who is stuck over in the corner of the uterus and the other baby who's got lots and lots of fluid around it. And once you know that a baby is monochorionic or the babies are monochorionic or identical twins, then those pregnancies should be followed every two weeks throughout the pregnancy until delivery with ultrasound, Spe specifically looking for any of the, the, the classical signs in ultrasound of twin-twin transfusion. And it's not just ultrasound. So the important thing is that ultrasound is done at the correct time. And the most useful time is initially at 11 to 14 weeks. And this applies to singleton pregnancies as well, because that's a time when we can see how many babies there are, we can measure the gestation, make sure the dates are correct, we can look for any abnormalities, um, and you can pick up signs that a baby may in fact uh, have a number of conditions that, that could be harmful to the pregnancy. So it, between, so it can be very successfully treated now, and the, the problem arises because of the anastomosing blood vessels, the blood vessels that are, are linked up to the blood vessels of the other baby. So what we do now is we do a, a fetoscopic procedure. So we use a very, very tiny, tiny telescope and through that, we, 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 we put that into the mum's tummy, a bit like an amniocentesis, and we can see the placenta, and then we pass a laser fiber down and essentially ablate or block off all of the, the culprit anastomosis. So the blood vessels are causing the problem, we divide each of those. So our attempt is trying to turn a, an identical or a, a monochorionic twin placenta into a dichorionic twin placenta. Now it's not, obviously, because they've got the same genetic material, but from the point of view of the vascular anastomosis, the blood vessels that are joining up, we completely divide those. And that can reverse the situation completely. And it doesn't really matter how sick the babies are because we've seen many babies with very severe heart failure where really there's poorly contractile heart. And the, this can be reversed very rapidly um, with, with a laser procedure. So the survival rate, if we do not do anything for twin-twin transfusion, is in the region of about 10 or 15%. That can be improved to about 80% for at least one baby and about 60 to 70% for both babies with timely intervention uh, by laser. What do you mean by and most patients who come who have the diagnosis uh, go to the operating room again within 24 hours. So I think making a rapid diagnosis, referring appropriately, and intervening in a timely manner results, uh, can give you very good results. It's not 100%. So for instance, in Canada, every year, there are about 250 cases of twin-twin transfusion. I'm not talking, not to mention the cases of TAPS and all of the other things you're mentioning. Um, and currently, there are between the three centers, so that's Vancouver, Montreal, and ourselves, there are approximately 100 cases treated every year. So we're missing an awful lot of cases. And some of it is there, the, if a mum is aware that her abdomen is increasing rapidly in size, then that might be a warning sign that she, in fact, is developing uh, extra fluid, which is the first sign of twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome.
The other problem with it is that if you have identical twins and one baby for whatever reason is to pass away, if the baby dies and the twins are identical, then the, the, the worst tragedy is that the other baby, the, the surviving twin, can actually have a stroke. And if the baby has a stroke, it will either die, it will recover completely, or it may recover with some kind of urological handicap. So the ultimate tragedy is that you lose one baby and you have another baby with uh, some kind of neurological damage. So in treating the condition, even if one baby is to pass away later on, at least what has happened is you've protected the sibling so that there should be no damage to the sibling uh, because those anastomoses have been blocked. I know you take the time. Um, thank no, you. The, the most important thing is really early ultrasound to determine chorionicity and that is by far the most important. And then after the diagnosis has been clearly made, and the, it can be made in the 100% of cases, then that those mums should be followed every two weeks for an ultrasound. If there's any suspicion on the ultrasound, that may be stepped up to once weekly. And if there's any of the classical signs on ultrasound, which everyone is aware of, any, any, any sonographer or, or radiologist will be aware of these, then those mums should be referred um, really immediately to, to one of the centers. Um, and there's always one of us on call. With <coughs> I can see everything great. So that's the normal one. You can see the one down here. Okay. There we go. So that's really what it should be. See this little boy. I'm not pushing. You tell me if I'm pushing too hard. So do the hands there from the face. That's good. Right. So you love There's plenty of fluid around today. You're not filming what's on the screen right now, right? No, I've got you, just you. Okay.